Welcome to a new video. Let's take a look at some new malicious compliance stories. The first story is called, Time Zones Can Be Tricky. Many years ago I had a co-worker. Let's call him George. George was tasked with upgrading some servers located on the west coast of the United States. As part of the process, he needed someone at that location to physically power cycle them. The first few days went okay, outside of his boss barking at him over email to do only the server upgrades every time he was seen out of his seat doing other work. So while the system installed everything and he only sometimes had to call to ask for a reboot of the system, he read a book and looked busy. Well, until one Monday when the West Coast guy went on vacation. His first call of the day went to straight to voicemail, telling him to contact someone else instead. George did, only to hear the woman wasn't at her desk. Eventually, he dialed main reception at that office to see what was going on. She won't be in until 7. Try back after then. More waiting, more servers. Around 10 Eastern, he got his call back. Sorry. Both our day side are on vacation for the next two weeks, so that only leaves me. I've gotten your list rebooted, you're good to go. Before walking out the door, George emailed his boss, telling him about the scheduling and asking if he could come in late. No, was the response. You're not special and you need to be in at 8, just like everyone else. George emailed back. What if I come in at 7 and do the reboots then? Thanks to the time zone difference, I can still catch the night shift person and have sufficient warning if there's a problem. Once again it was a hard no. He was not to postpone reboots. He was not to reboot them himself. And he was not to alter his starting time. The email went on to criticize his work ethic, telling him that if he was worried about the small amount of extra work involved, maybe he should find a different job. Okay. George was pretty sure his boss had just glossed over every Pacific Standard Time or Eastern Standard Time in his emails as well as the references to time zones, but who knows. Following orders meant at least 5 hours a day in authorized overtime to sit and read a book, so it was a big win. And then Friday came. George knew that his West Coast contact didn't work Friday and that no one would be in the office at all to do a reboot. So he got started on a different project, letting the boss know he was blocked until Monday and requesting some details on the other project. Why are you asking about the other project? The server upgrades are the top priority, so stop trying to fool me with this blocking nonsense and get them done. I don't want to hear about this again. The email closed with a thinly veiled threat to fire George for any back talk and a reminder that insubordination wouldn't earn him unemployment. So George followed orders. Along with reading his book, he spent a few minutes to fill out a backdated transfer application to my department. Maybe his boss will be happy to let him go after what he's about to pull. When 10.30 rolled around he looked up the organization chart. The boss didn't want to hear about it, but he had a problem and had to speak to someone. After a few unanswered calls as he went more or less straight up, George finally spoke to a confused vice president, who asked for the relevant emails and told him to go home. The next morning, George had a shiny new email, sent by his boss around one and conspicuously included the vice president, apologizing for his total failure to comprehend the time zones and schedules of those involved and the completely inappropriate tone and language in earlier emails. It was followed by another, from the vice president, assuring George that he had done nothing wrong and that any concerns, of any kind, should be reported to him as soon as possible. He replied to the vice president, well, sir. I applied for the open position in the other department several days ago, and I'm afraid that, given this incident and his past behavior, my boss will block my transfer. This just might be what makes him lose it or discipline me in a way that makes me ineligible. Guess who got the desk next to mine two days later, without so much as an interview? George. I wasn't even told I had a new guy until he was inboxing his desk and introducing himself. The next story is called, You Don't Know How To Use The Machine. It was my first job out of high school. I was hired as a trainee in a large engine reconditioning company. It was one of those family-run businesses that started in the backyard and grew to the point where they might have been making millions, but they were likely spending just as much. All the family members worked there in all the top positions, so you were never going to move up the ladder. I was stationed at an old milling machine. No computer, no smart tech. You mounted a cylinder head in the bay. You manually dragged the milling head over. Visually lowered it until it made contact, then raised it up a one hundredth of a millimeter. Turned the mill on and manually wound the head across the part you will mill. I got pretty good at using this mill. The average heads milled per day was around 21. In one day I'd sometimes do 50. But luckily the worker in the station next to me caught on and when I was about to report my day's worth of work, he said 21. I was still young and dumb. So I proudly said 50. He corrected me. 21, tomorrow you pretend to work light bulb moment that I always remember to this day. 
I'm in my 40s now. So, from then on I'd work hard one day and have an easy day the next. One day the mill needed serious maintenance. The company was so tight that they didn't regularly maintain any of the machines. They waited until they needed repairs. I wrote down the issue I had and mentioned that this mill was not operational. At any random moment, the mill would jump and the head would drop about a millimeter. The diamond tips would gouge the cylinder head and most of the tips would snap. Expensive. Instead of being told, thanks for reporting it, we'll get it fixed right away, they told me off for being abusive to the machine. That I didn't know how to use it correctly. Normally, when something like this happened, and it happened a lot, they would demote you to the acid wash or the camshaft bearing resurfacer. But instead, they sent me to the new laser guided computerized mill. Which was also out of order but had been waiting for the tech to come and resolve the issue. The guide probe that was used when you initially put a new part in there was malfunctioning. The machine would sense the part, and instead of stopping, resetting and then sense the part again at a higher resolution, it would smash the probe into the part and break the tip. Costing lots of money. I tried to tell the supervisor that the machine he was sending me to was out of order. But he shut me up before I even opened my mouth. He jumped on the old mill and made me stick around to show me how to do it properly. The mill couldn't have messed up at any better moment. About 30% into the job, the head dropped a few centimeters, not millimeters. Smashed into the head, the head went flying off the otherwise pretty solid mounts. Being an old mill, you could run this without the guard door shut. Which the supervisor did. I went to say to please shut the door. But he shut me up again. Fine. I stood well away. Guess which direction the cylinder head went flying. Right at him. Hit him in the chest, winded him, knocked him to the floor and I immediately called an ambulance. He was rushed off to the hospital and returned to work with some broken ribs. It didn't end there though. He blamed me for everything upon returning to work and said he hoped I continued working on the other mill. I was stationed at the acid wash by another supervisor, another family member. A big box with a cage. We dumped parts into it. And back out. Simple. Menial. Perfect. Nothing could really go wrong. I went to say the other mill was broken too. And I tried to remind him that the probes kept snapping. He wanted none of it. Once again showing me how to use the fancy mill. He instructed me to lift the cylinder into the mill and mount it. He programmed the mill for that model head. Closed the door, and pressed start. The probe came down and kept going. Shattering into the head. He swore so hard he hurt his ribs. Do you want me to go back to the acid wash now until this is fixed? I got sent to the area where we removed head studs. Better than the wash. We used blow torches. I guess he didn't want to be told what to do. The last story is called, Compliance by Not Doing My Job. I used to work as a programmer at a manufacturing facility. Back in the mid-2000s, we added the ability to order certain products online. My job was to build a service that would accept the order request from the main website and print out labels in the warehouse, which then got stuck onto the individual items in the order. The labels were printed on stickers. SSME were round and some were rectangular. We had two special printers hooked up for this. Little things about the size of label makers, that took spools of stickers instead of trays of paper. This is where all the fun happens. My boss was a total jerk. He was supposed to be in a tech lead or technical manager type of role, but his knowledge of technology was horrible. His management skills weren't any better. On the day he joined the company, the first thing he said to us after mutual introductions were, I used to work for the IRS, so don't ever make me mad, or I'll ruin your life. I still have back doors I put in there. He kind of half acted like he was joking, but seemed half serious as well. He said this another time too, out of the blue at some team lunch or something. Really weird and off-putting, and highly unprofessional. Not to mention unethical and possibly illegal. And no, there's no way he had put in any back doors. He couldn't find his own back door with a mirror on a stick. Anyway, my last project at that company was the label printing service. I put in my two weeks notice around the time I started working on it. Because the boss had no planning skills, he insisted that I just plan for doing the actual coding, so I could get it done before I left. He didn't want me to, waste time, on documentation or knowledge transfer. It's a small system. The other guys can figure it out if there are problems. We need to get it up and running as soon as possible. Okay, code only it is. Full compliance with the boss's orders. I get the first pass deployed with a couple of days to spare and spend most of that time tweaking and hardening it and trying to get some sort of documentation in place for the less obvious bits of it. There wasn't much there when I left. Fast forward two weeks. I'm at my new job, and former co-worker, Tom, calls me. 
Tom hated my old boss as much as I had, but it turns out he had put him up to making the call. Hey, the boss wants to ask you something. Do you have a minute? I told him to put him on while wondering why the idiot didn't just call me himself. Presumably, he thought I'd ignore him. I wouldn't have, partly because I try not to be a jerk, and partly out of curiosity. The boss was very polite to me as he told me how the printers had just stopped working and asked if I had any idea what the problem might be. Needless to say, I was gobsmacked. I held back my snarkier thoughts and just reminded him politely that I don't work there anymore, and without actually being on site to examine the system, there was no way I could help anyway. Okay, thanks anyway. I found out later from Tom that the printers had been down for a few days, and the boss was in a panic, cursing my name to all and sundry. One of his many stellar management qualities was an ability to go straight to yelling and trying to assign blame, skipping straight past all that pesky, focusing on what went wrong and how to fix it. He actually went so far as suggest I had deliberately sabotaged the system. It turned out that the real root of the problem was that the print settings had just reverted or had been reverted to the defaults. So the software was running against the wrong paper size and in one case the wrong orientation. One of the things I didn't document was that the print setup had to be configured specifically for the small round labels and the small, rectangular, 90 degree rotated labels. I didn't document that because I figured getting the paper size and orientation correct would be self-evident to anybody who had ever used a printer before. And also, the boss told me not to waste time. If you're wondering how incompetent Tom must have been to not have found the problem sooner, it's because the boss was riding herd on him to suss out where I had messed up the code. I'm sure the notion occurred to him fairly early on, but he wasn't given the chance to look there until later, and even then, the specifics probably wouldn't have been obvious. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel for more content. Let me know what you think about the stories in the comment section below. Have a great day. Bye bye.